Hello, hello everybody. How you doing? I hope you're doing well. It's, as you can tell from the look of it, it's a little bit cooler here in New Zealand at the moment. We've got kind of sunshine outside at the moment, but like an hour ago it was howling a gale. The rain was so noisy on the chimney over, over there, sorry, over there, that I was thinking, is that rain or is that hail? And what's it going to be like by the time we actually get to, to reading? So if it suddenly gets really loud here, I'll try to sit closer to my microphone so that its automatic system actually recognises that that's the sound we're listening to, not everything else. We'll see what happens. Anyway, so uh, what's up? Um, yeah, I'm going to read your story very shortly. Uh, I better say hi to those who are new here in case there are anyone is there there is anyone new here um, and also for those who would l watch this after I have finished reading by watching the VOD that's the the video on demand the recording of the video or for those who are watching over on YouTube because there are actually quite a few people who do watch on YouTube they don't realize what they're missing out because they don't get to chat if they're actually over on YouTube rather than on Twitch. But that's okay. That's okay. You have to go with what's going to work for you. Right. So, hi, I'm Jeff. I read old children's books. I'm trying to remember the right words to say. I used to say old-fashioned children's stories, but they're not old-fashioned. They actually are old. And they are books, not just stories. So I might as well say that. Okay. I'm Jeff. I read old children's books. Um, typical of the sort of books I read are ones that look a little bit like this. Um, this book was gifted to my grandmother's brother in July 1897, which means that the book was printed before then. In fact, they often used to have the books sitting around in, in storage um, until they were all sold. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to get a brand new book and discover that it had actually been printed a number of years previously just because that's the way the, the old systems used to work for books so one of the things that's inter intriguing about old books is if it's old enough sometimes you can actually feel the impression that the printing press has made when it presses the letter forms into the page to transfer the ink off the typeface onto the paper and then on top of that you get these illustrations such as this one here Oh, that's clarifying nicely. You can't necessarily see the line work on it properly, but that illustration is made by scratching usually a metal plate, um, not always a metal plate, sometimes it would be stone or wood, um, scratching a plate and then rubbing ink into the scratches on it, wiping off the excess ink and then putting it, the printing plate and paper over the top of it into a printing press squeezing them really hard together and then separating them and that would leave the ink on the paper which then has to be dried um, uh, until it's not going to transfer ink anymore and so it's quite a laborious intense uh, process to actually get words on a page for people to read so they would print as many books as they thought were likely to be sold um, and then ship out to the different booksellers however many books they'd requested obviously which wasn't necessarily how many the whole print run was occasionally you would get um, a book that became so popular that they would have to reprint it and reprint it and reprint it because there was so much demand for it otherwise you would often have books sitting around in storage for a very very long time and maybe then eventually being sent off to be um, destroyed I guess is what they did with them I don't know that they actually recycled their paper the way we would these days where it was broken down into pulp again and then remolded into paper just because it's quite a complicated process anyway so that's the sort of books that I started with for my personal reading apart from learning to read picture books school books that sort of thing um, we had a tendency in our family 
to keep old books because they were considered quite valuable because, yeah, with something that was that labour intensive, it was they would cost quite a bit. So birthday presents, Christmas presents, it wasn't unusual to be given a book as a present. And they were, they were highly valued within the family, even by family members who were not particularly strong readers. Um, I was recently reading one of my dad's old books um, and I don't know that it was originally his book, it may have actually been his father's book. And Dad isn't a big reader, but it's one of his favourite books, and I've read it a number of times. So I grew up reading my parents' old books and my grandparents' old books, uh, and like my grandmother's brother's book, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. And there, are, there, there used to be a lot of people who would do that, where the books would be passed on through the family. And yes, yeah, some of them would get tossed out and some of them would be kept and things like that. But I realised sometime in the last few years, not, not that long ago really, that a lot of the rest of the world, even the readers amongst us, don't actually realise just what it is that's gone missing because we no longer keep old books because people aren't interested in them. So there's an assumption that, oh, well, I'll be able to just borrow that from the library. That only works if the books have been kept at the library, even in storage, or if they've been digitized and made available as eBooks. So for example, um, our, our local library system, which is for not just our town, but it's actually for the, for the whole of the broader city area, um, and we can request books from other libraries. The tendency is that if a book doesn't get issued often enough, it will be sold or given away or trashed, recycled. If a book is under three years old, it's likely to stay on the shelves for a bit longer. If it's over three years old, unless it's super popular, it's gone because they want the space for, for newer books. Because people want new books. They want the latest story that everybody's talking about. I remember when um, uh, the Twilight series, the Twilight Saga came out and their bo the books from the Twilight Saga were in all of the local libraries, all of the regional libraries. Um, then we went through a phase where there was a whole lot of them got put onto the sale carts and you could get a copy for yourself fairly cheap of whichever one that was that you were missing. They would probably keep a few copies in the library system, but not as many as they originally bought, just because they want more shelf space for the next rash of fashionable books that people were requesting. Um, and Percy Jackson was another series of books that, that, that were very, very popular, did really well, and in fact, if you were collecting the books for yourself, um, it could be quite disappointing where you'd start off a series, you'd buy yourself a copy of the book, um, you'd get part way through the series with these books, and then the publishers decided that they were going to reissue the whole series again, but with a different cover design. And so, like, but I've got whatever the series is, um, another series that we've got is, yeah, Harry Potter was another series that was, was like that. Uh, one of the series we've got is the Owen Colfer. Um, Oh, what's it called? I can't remember. He's Irish. He was a school teacher and he wrote this series of um, books about, um, oh, I need to remember the, the character's name, the lead character's name, but they had the leprechaun, leprechaun. It was not leprechauns as we think of to do with um, Irish fairy tales. He said it was the Lower Elements Police Recon Division. And so you had this this wonderful series of quirky stories that were based on fairy folk, but fairy folk were not quite the way we expected them to be. Um, and the young man who was trying to find them and their magic book so that he could actually use them for his own purposes, which was primarily to get his father, get his father returned to him. Uh, rescued from some terrible place and then you had the series of books so we had the first few books from that series I've managed to pick them up actually through a, um, a second hand place even though they were brand new books and then they reissued them with a whole different cover design and so the style of these covers that I had which I was really enjoying they had this shiny 
um, texture to them and all sorts of stuff like this and it's like I've got four of the the six books and then the last two is like do I still want to keep collecting them or not because I can't get the style that I actually originally had and it's like having a dinner set and you're buying it piece by piece you've got this wonderful matching set and then suddenly the last two plates that you have to get they've decided that they're going to do them completely differently with a different style of drawing on the covers and all this sort of stuff. And so this is one of the things that happens in the publishing industry because we want to refresh it, we want people to rediscover it so we can sell some more. And it's not so much about the story, it's actually more about selling the books. Anyway, so there's a lot of that sort of thing goes on. In the old days, long before my time, even though I'm old, in the old days, generally they didn't restyle things quite so much to sell more of them but they were still um, aware of the fact that 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 something was popular and therefore was going to need reprinting and things like that all of that sort of stuff so I grew up reading old books that's really what that was all about um, and then I realized that there's a lot of old books that are no longer available and the general public doesn't actually get to to read them so um, some of them are available on as ebooks on public domain websites, such as um, Project Gutenberg, and I'll give you a link for that. So Project Gutenberg has public domain books, um, and the public domain rules that they are using are the American rules, which is a book goes into public domain 70 years after the author's death. I'm pretty sure that's the system that they're working on. Different countries have different rules, and I, I'm still figuring out my way around, is it the rules that are based on the country of the, the person who's reading the book, or is it the rules that are based on where the author was when the book was published? And I think the rules can be a little bit different. If you've got an author who's published a book that's that's been released by two different publishing houses, one in England and, say, one in America, are the rules different between those two countries for whether or not the book is, is remains in copyright or or is now in public? I don't know. It's all very complicated. You look online to try and find out, and it's like, ah, my head is spinning. I'm I can't keep up. And if you want to read a book that is still within um, copyright publicly, you are meant to get permission to do so. Um, otherwise you risk having your um, recording taken down or actually being taken to court and having to pay a, f a fine or a fee for it. Um, so, but it's not that easy to find out who the current copyright owner is on a book where the author has already died. Is, it, is the copyright held by the publisher? Is it held by the estate of the person who, who wrote the book? And how do you get hold of them? There is no universal database, even within each country, for the different authors. How do you get hold of them? How, how do you find them, first of all? How do you get hold of them? How do you get their permission? If you are going to read the books and you're not making a big profit off it, and you're not actually um, diluting the value of their product, which is the books, obviously the stories, um, Will they actually give you permission? Will they expect you to pay a fee for performance rights, which technically is what we're doing when we're reading a book online? So there's all these sort of factors, which is which all contribute to the fact that I prefer to read public domain books. Less likely to have trouble with that sort of thing. Anyway, so keeping that in mind, there are a group of people who read public domain books online so that you can enjoy them so that these books are no longer completely forgotten by everybody, but can be enjoyed and appreciated. Some of the books are ones that are already really well known, books by people like um, Shakespeare, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens. Those are public domain books. But there are other books that are already in public domain, which you may never have heard of, and they're really worth following up on and finding out about. Um, I'm part of this group of readers, and I shall give you the link for it. It is, sorry, um, I know my keyboard is very noisy, and it comes up through the microphone, and I'm really sorry about that, but there's not a lot I can do until I actually get an off-my-desk microphone stand, or some way of actually having my microphone where it can pick up my voice, but it's not picking up all the impact sounds from the keyboard and and wobbling my desk or anything else like that. That's why I try not to lean on it. 
because it also makes the, ca the camera shake because that's fastened to my computer on top of my desk. Anyway, so um, Codex is this group of readers and we all read public domain books and I was going to tell you about them. So the Codex readers most of them do other things as well like playing games on Twitch and stuff like that um, I don't not at this stage because I'm still getting my head around working with my the computer I currently have which is actually far more capable of playing games and streaming at the same time eventually I'll play games online but currently I don't I just read books online um, but the codex readers are a great bunch of people we're all amateurs at this aspect of it really if you think about it but some of us actually read books professionally we have a reader in the codex group who reads audiobooks as their job and they read audiobooks for um, audible i think which is part of the amazon group of companies and that's his his normal day job there's another reader who does voice acting there may be more than one actually, um, who does voice acting and I think also does some normal acting but their, their main work is voice acting um, and yet they, they still value spending time reading books just for the pleasure of reading a book without having to worry about getting it perfect, without having to worry about redoing that but read doing a new a fresh take of something um, about whether they got the, the words right or wrong just a straight through read and and sometimes they chat sometimes they don't so there's a fairly wide variety of us like I say there's there's, there's um, some who do read professionally but for this aspect of it reading a public domain book we're basically all amateurs um, some have better reading skills than others, that's all. Um, there's, we've got school teachers, we've got, um, I don't know, a whole wide range of it. So the link that I've just given you for Codex is for our Discord server. And um, the Codex readers get together once a month and have a book club and you're welcome to be part of that. You can type questions into the chat for whoever it is that you're watching that's streaming it. There will be several of the Codex readers that will be discussing the book. Um, and it's like a traditional book club where you read it beforehand and then discuss it together, that sort of thing. Um, but also, if you want to watch, uh, if you want to listen and watch any of the readers when they're actually reading, like I read live on Twitch, then down below on my um, panels on Twitch, I have links to all of our Codex readers on their, twi their Twitch channels so you can scroll down below my video window and find those links and go and check them all out and follow them and support them listen to the stories they're reading encourage them in their reading um, twitch hasn't really twigged to the fact that this is actually something that people really want to do because i mean as a as a um, classification on twitch reading fun which is what a lot of us classify our reading streams as um, technically to classify something on Twitch it's referred to as being a game and Twitch then will put up an icon for that game um, there are other as other areas where it's not actually a game like just chatting food and drink um, crafting and making I think is another one all of those actually have a logo that is used at, for their for the category on Twitch but Reading Fun hasn't got one yet, so maybe let's just prove them wrong and say there are lots of people who want to watch this stuff. There are lots of people doing it, and so it's about time they got themselves sorted out and gave us an, uh, um, um, an icon, a cover, a picture, a whatever it is that, that represents Reading Fun, and so therefore people can find us more easily. Anyway, Codex, follow the readers, get involved with what they're doing. Um, join the discord server uh, and those of you who are watching on twitch i do have a youtube channel and that's where you will find my um playlists for the different books that i have already read 
the recordings that are made here when I'm reading on Twitch get transferred over to YouTube uh, once a week, once once every couple of weeks, but they get released on the same days. Each of the recordings get released um, um, across the spread of a week or so um, into the playlists so you can actually have a listen right through all the different books I've previously read. Uh, generally speaking, all of the books I've read, each book is a playlist. There are a couple that aren't, but that's all right. doesn't matter. You'll find your way around. And if you're watching this over on YouTube and you want to actually get involved with when I'm reading live, such as sometimes I don't understand a word and I will actually ask if anyone in chat understands it, you as a viewer can type in your understanding of it or a definition of a word that you've looked up or something like that into the chat. If you come over to Twitch and follow us over there, you can actually be part of the conversation. So go on, don't miss out. Um, it's a great way to actually get involved and get to know other people. There are, um, I know a lot of people um, because I've got to know them through watching other people's Twitch streams. And it's a good way to get to know other people who have, have interests in common. Even if it's just that one area that you're watching that you actually have in common. Anyway, so how about I get on with reading, except for the three tips that I meant to have already given you, which nobody has pointed out that I haven't yet. So if you're new here, these are the three tips. One, have something handy to drink. Two, have something to snack on. And three, have somewhere comfortable to sit or lie or whatever. But if you have to work or study or something like that and you can't get too comfortable, that's okay. We don't mind. Um, you can always type lurk, exclamation mark lurk, in the chat. Um, and then it will tell me that you're there and you're listening but just not actually engaging in the chat. Um, and the reason why you might want to do that is so I can say hi to you, if you're happy for me to say hi to you. If you don't really want me to say hi to you in public, then don't type lurk. And then I won't do so. I'll try not to anyway. Um, anything else? I think that's about it. Uh, if you are, if you follow me on, on Twitch, then you can use the um, emotes that I've actually put into the channel that are available for followers. If you are a subscriber, there is so far one emote that is available. There will be more coming when I figure out what I'm doing for them and exactly how to do it because I'm not really good with I can I can adjust photos using graphics tools I can't draw on top of photos very well my mouse skills are not that good um, but eventually we'll get the rest of the emotes done and we'll even get some ones that move and flash and do all sorts of weird things like that most of them are based on my weirdo faces that I pull so it doesn't matter um, let's get on with reading eh we're currently reading The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbitt and it was published in 1906. It is the third of a trilogy. The first book in the trilogy is called Five Children and It and the It that's referred to in the title is the Samiad, a sand fairy. Um, the last one of its kind or probably the last of its kind at the time of the story, allergic to water. Uh, water, either a, a small amount of water can injure it or make it ill, a large amount of water will kill it. So therefore it, it, it tends to sort of be a little bit toey when you discuss going somewhere where there's a lot of water. Um, so that's five children in it and it, had the, it has the ability to grant wishes. Um, the children have a lot of adventures and discover that wishing for something doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have a great result. Um, and there was lots of fun and games to do with that in the first book and you can actually listen to those book, that, that first book over on YouTube as I mentioned. Um, the second book in the series was called The Phoenix and the Carpet and in that one the carpet grants wishes and the phoenix is basically a bit of a go-between for them. The phoenix knows all about what the carpet can do and can't do. Um, and kind of keeps an eye on the children. Uh, as we work our way through the books, we discover that the children are actually learning that if you're going to wish for something, you need to be quite specific about how you wish for it and what you are wishing for. Uh, there are consequences to getting what it is that you wish for. Uh, that they're learning, they're getting better at this sort of thing. Um, it's just 
I think the author has had a lot of fun with realising that, that you could create some quite good scenarios by um, giving these children the opportunity to, to have whatever it is they wished for. But it doesn't always work out the way you want. And so the third book in the series is the story of the amulet. Now the amulet is this thing that they have found and it has the ability to also grant wishes. But most of the time what is happening with the amulet is it's taking them somewhere not actually giving them something. Um, it's not the full amulet. They're trying to find the full amulet. They have got a part of it which takes them to places where it may or may not have been because they're trying to find the rest of it. And we're going to find out a little bit more about it. We're about four chapters off the end of the book and it will get resolved by the end. The children's main focus is this time around is that they really dearly want to have at least mother but pro preferably also mother and father back at home. Father is away as a correspondent reporting on a war over in Manchuria which was far eastern China and mother is away on an island in the Mediterranean because she has been unwell and needs a rest and they're missing their parents dearly and they would like to have them back. And so instead of being for their own gain financially or bikes, cameras, watches, sweets, that sort of thing, it's actually more because they just want to be together again. And so they have been learning. They have been learning over the years, over the books. So that's great. And what's intriguing with this one is the fact that the Samiad is the one who arranged for them to get this, this piece of the amulet um, because it seems to think that... It wants to help them somehow rather than just ignoring them. It wants to be involved with whatever it is that they're wishing for. And I haven't quite figured that out yet as to why this the, the Samiad actually wants to still be involved. Hopefully we'll find out before we get to the end of the story. Anyway, I've got my special drink for today, which is coffee. So I'm just going to take a mouthful. My other main drink is water and I wave this bottle of water at you because it's got a lid on it and it doesn't spill everywhere but when I'm actually drinking I usually just use this but I can't shake it round because it splashes and I don't have any snacks at the moment but I don't need any but you do so make sure you've got some handy right uh, making sure I've got everything going properly um, yes, you will see me from time to time looking across to my other monitor and the main reason for that is because there are some things I need to keep an eye on, things that might happen, uh, things that might be to do with um, making sure our chat stays safe, things like that. Uh, making sure that we don't have too many bots visiting our chat. Um, one of the things I'm very aware of is the fact, if you, if you are a streamer, you might want to know this, is that there is such a thing as chat bots where it will sit watching everybody who is visiting your channel and chatting together in your channel, and it will save people's personal information and then sell it. Well, it, it's being saved for somebody who's going to then use it and sell it. Um, like harvesting for being able to spam or do other more nefarious things not good um, but the another thing that can happen is sometimes you will have people who will gift subs to others who are in chat subscriptions this is I'm explaining to twitch people YouTube people you can kind of semi tune out at the moment unless you want to know more about this so you can do twitch stuff um, so one of the th another thing that happens is on Twitch you can you can subscribe to somebody's channel, which means that they will get a small payment as well as the Twitch system actually getting a payment, um, and it means that you can have um, different extra em emotes available for chat and all sorts of things like that. Sometimes people will do things that are only for people who have subscribed, but it's a great way to show a streamer that you are supportive of what they're doing but there is a system which means that somebody even if if um, whether or not they've got their own subscription people can give subscriptions to other people gifting a sub 
it's called. And unfortunately, if there are bots sitting in your chat, they can receive those subscriptions. Which means that real people are missing out. So that's why sometimes I will look across at my other monitor and just check and maybe do a little bit of typing to ban bots that might happen to have popped in. People write them um, and try to use them for all sorts of things. And so what we do is we just keep an eye on things and then we clear them out of the way so that they are not going to cause problems. And there are a bunch of people who stream who don't think it's a problem. They don't realize just how destructive it can be. And it's also discouraging for somebody who's put the money into giving a subscription to somebody else. And if it's a random gifting that they're doing instead of actually targeting a person, you know, like you can choose who you gift a sub to, or you can provide a subscription or a group of subscriptions and let Twitch randomly choose from people who are watching your chat, um, watching your stream, who's going to receive it. And it's those ones that that end up basically receiving something that you have saved money for and put into it. And it's just going to something that's not real. It's not a real person. They're not going to keep on coming back and, and, and getting involved with your your stream or chatting with you and getting to know your friends and, and stuff like that. It's actually just a way of ripping people off. And I don't think that's a good idea. So that's why sometimes I will be looking over here like this. But that's okay. Um, just ignore it when I do, and I do actually get distracted from time to time, ADHD, it's just one of those things, it makes it fun sometimes because I'll get halfway through a sentence and lose where I am in the sentence while I actually have my eyes on the words on the page. Um, so I am actually reading an ebook at the moment, this is my first generation iPad mini which I was, um, as a hand-me-down gift, it's lovely, um, but it may, I can't do anything else on it but it's great for being able to read books on because I can still download them from Project Gutenberg. So let's get on with reading. The Story of the Amulet by Edith Nesbitt. We are reading chapter 11, Before Pharaoh. And do you remember what the last chapter was? I can't. Um, was that Caesar? When they met Caesar. I think it was. Anyway, so we'll carry on. Oh yeah, I know what you exactly mean there, Tina. I have the uh, Tina has just said I have the fun disadvantage of my eyes and brain moving too fast for my mouth to keep up when I'm reading out loud. I think sometimes that's why I stumble over words. There's something similar to that. Anyway, so I'll carry on with. We'll, we'll actually get reading. I'm glad you put that comment in there. It's it's a great way to actually help help us to understand what goes on in people's heads when they're reading. So, um, I don't need to look at the clock, I need to look at the page. <laughs> Chapter 11, Before Pharaoh. It was the day after the adventure of Julius Caesar and the little black girl, that was a girl who was dressed all in black, like she was in mourning clothes, but they weren't quite the right size for her. Um, anyway, the little black girl, Cyril, bursting into the bathroom to wash his hands for dinner, you have no idea how dirty they were, for he had been playing shipwrecked mariners all the morning on the leads at the back of the house where the water cistern is, and I'll explain that in a minute, found Anthea, that's the um, Cyril's the oldest, Anthea's the second, found Anthea leaning her elbows on the edge of the bath and crying steadily into it. Now I'll do the explaining. The leads is up on the roof of a house, the older houses, you would have the roof tiles would come down like this and then sometimes on the, along the back part of the house there would be a flashish bit um, where you had like a tank that held water to provide the pressure for the water down to the taps in the house and other things like that or just because that side of the house wasn't seen so they didn't need to do a fancy roof that everyone could have a look at and stuff and they would cover that part to seal the roof um, because they didn't have plastics and, and silicon caulking and the, all that sort of stuff back then they would use lead sheets of lead and they would be molded because lead is a very soft metal they would be put across the surface so they'd have timber underneath and then lead over the top and then they would curve it up so it goes up under the tiles a little bit so the water couldn't get through 
um, they would use a soldering iron and solder to join up sections of the lead if they needed to, things like this. That whole area where you have a flat roof that is usually surfaced with lead is called the leads. It just was because it's made with lead. Anyway, so that's where the water system is, which is an, a tank that has water to provide water down into the house. So it gets the, the piping comes in from else, elsewhere that's up high enough to provide the pressure to fill up the tank and then the water the, the water uses gravity to go down to the different uses in the house. So that's the system. Just in case you were wondering where it was, a great place to get out on the roof and be out in fresh air but it's usually got sort of like a lot of dirt and muck up there because in these days they were using coal fires and things like that so you get all this stuff on the surfaces on that part of the roof, hence why he's really dirty and needs to wash his hands. Anyway, he goes into the bathroom, finds Anthea, his sister, leaning her elbows on the edge of the bath and crying. Hello, he said with brotherly concern. What's up now? Dinner will be cold before you've got enough salt water for a bath. He's kind of trying to just make conversation but un unsure what's going on. Go away, said Anthea fiercely. I hate you. I hate everybody. There was a stricken pause. I didn't know, said Cyril, tamely. Like, yes, he could have actually been quite abrupt with her for talking to him like that, but she wasn't. He wasn't. I didn't know, said Cyril, tamely. Nobody ever does know anything, sobbed Anthea. I didn't know you were waxy. I thought you'd just hurt your fingers with the tap again like you did last week, Cyril carefully explained. Oh, fingers, sneered Anthea through her sniffs. Here, drop it, Panther, he said uncomfortably. Panther's her nickname. You haven't been having a row or anything? No, she said. Wash your horrid hands, for goodness sake, if that's what you came for. Or go. Anthea was so seldom cross that when she was cross, the others were always more surprised than angry. Cyril edged along the side of the bath and stood beside her. He put his hand on her arm. Dry up, do, he said, rather tenderly for him. And finding that though she did not at once take his advice, she did not seem to resent it, he put his arm awkwardly across her shoulders and rubbed his head against her ear. There, he said in a tone of one administering a priceless cure for all possible sorrows. Now, what's up? Promise you won't laugh, she said. I don't feel laughish myself, said Cyril dismally. Well then, said Anthea, leaning her ear against his head. Sorry, itchy nose. It's mother. What's the matter with mother? asked Cyril, with apparent want of sympathy. She was all right in her letter this morning. Yes, but I want her so. You're not the only one, said Cyril briefly, and the brevity of his tone admitted a good deal. Oh yes, said Anthea, I know. We all want her all the time, but I want her most now, most dreadfully, awfully much. I never wanted anything so much. That Imogen child, the way the ancient British Queen cuddled her up, and Imogen wasn't me, and the Queen was mother. And then her letter this morning, and about the lamb liking the salt bathing, and she bathed him in his very bath the night before she went, this very bath, the night before she went away. Oh, oh, she said. Cyril thumped her on the back. Cheer up, he said. You know my inside thinking that I was doing? Well, that was partly about mother. We'll soon get her back. If you'll chuck it like a sensible kid and wash your face, I'll tell you about it. That's right. You let me get to the tap. Can't you stop crying? Shall I put the door key down your back? The cold of the, the, the metal being dropped down your back. That's for noses, said Anthea, and I'm not a kid any more than you are. But she laughed a little, and her mouth began to... Sorry, I've got something weird going on on my um, phone here. It's not meant to be doing it that way. We'll see. See what happens. Um... But she laughed a little and her mouth began to get back into its proper shape. You know what an odd shape your mouth gets into when you cry in earnest. Look here, said Cyril, working the soap round and round between his hands in a thick slime of grey soap suds from all the dirt that's on his hands. I've been thinking, we've only just played with the amulet so far. We've got to work it now. 
work it for all it's worth. And it isn't only mother either. There's father out there among all of the... The, all among the fighting. I don't howl about it, but I think... Oh, bother the soap. The grey-lined soap had squirted out under the pressure of his fingers and hit Anthea's chin with as much force as, it, as though it had been shot from a catapult. There now, she said regretfully, now I shall have to wash my face. You'd have had to do that anyway, said Cyril with conviction. Now, my idea is this. You know missionaries... Yes, said Anthea, who did not know a single one. Well, they always take the savages' beads and brandy and stays and hats and braces and really useful things, things the savages haven't got and never heard about. And the savages love them for their kind generousness and give them pearls and shells and ivory and cassowaries, and that's the way. Wait a sec, said Anthea, splashing. I can't hear what you're saying, shells and shells and things like that said Cyril. The great thing is to get people to love you by being generous. So they're not trying to be rude about people from other countries, but the fact is that in the time period that the children are from, what they're talking about is that people would go from England, uh, usually representing the church or some other organization that was trying to help people they would go to other countries where life was not as easy as it was in England I suppose um, they didn't have the same level of lifestyle they didn't have the same level of clothing and goods and all that sort of stuff and they would take things and use them as gifts to the people that they were going to but then also they would do things like they would teach them to read if they were a, a, a place where it wasn't common to be able to read. Man, that rains loud. I hope it's not too loud for you while you're listening. I'll try and get a little bit closer to the microphone so that you can hear me just a little bit better. Um, well, more loudly than the rain anyway. Um, and so they would take things and use them as gifts, as a way of making a point of contact, being more accepted by the people that they were wanting to work with. Uh, now we would consider it not entirely appropriate because it's a way of saying basically we're better than you. Or it can be taken that way. It wasn't necessarily fully intended that way. It's just that they recognised that we have things that we can do. Uh, we have things that you don't have and so maybe we can help you with, with providing those things or giving you the skills or whatever. Um, anyway, yeah, really heavy rain shower outside. And so I think it's started to quieten down. And, and I can also now see the sunshine on the grass. It's amazing the way it changes so much. Anyway, we're carrying, and you can still hear the wind in the chimney as well as the rain that was on it before. So that's what we've got to do, said Cyril. Next time we go into the past, we'll regularly fit out the expedition. You remember how the Babylonian queen froze onto that pocket book? Well, we'll take things like that and offer them in exchange for a sight of the amulet. A sight of it is not much good. No, silly, but don't you see, when we've seen it, we shall know where it is, and we shall go, we can go and take it in the night when everybody's asleep. It wouldn't be stealing, would it, said Anthea thoughtfully, because it will be such an awfully long time ago when we do it. Oh, there's that bell again. As soon as dinner was eaten, that was the dinner bell. As soon as dinner was eaten, it was, it was tinned salmon and lettuce and a jam tart. And the cloth cleared away, the idea was explained to the others, and the Samiad was roused from sand. So the Samiad goes to sand like children go to bed. Because he's a sand fairy, so he likes being in sand. Um, the Samiad was aroused from sand, and asked what it thought would be good merchandise, with which to buy the affection of, say, the ancient Egyptians, and whether it thought the amulet was likely to be found in the court of Pharaoh. That's pretty good thinking. But it shook its head and shot out its snail's eyes hopelessly. I should probably find you a picture of the Samiad so you know what we're talking about. And I'm sorry, um, there, I know there is at least one picture of the Samiad. And I'm just wondering if I can find one that shows it more clearly than others. That one. Okay, I'll just... 
get the picture for you so you can actually see what I'm talking about. And then we can carry on with the rest of the story. Uh, that's this one here. It's not the best of pictures of the Samiad, but it'll do. Right, so there's the Samiad there, that blackish thing, that's the children sitting around it. It's sitting on a platter that has sand on it, because it likes sand, it's very comfortable, that's the sort of place it makes it home, it's home. Now the description of the Samiad in one of the earlier books, I'm just trying to make it a bit bigger so you can see it better, because it's actually a very small illustration. The description is that it has a body a little bit like a monkey, long arms and hands and legs and feet, covered in hair, and it has ears like a bat's ears, and then instead of normal eyes, it has eyes up on stalks like snail's eyes, and it can pull them in close, and it can poke them out a long distance, and it can actually sort of kind of look around the corner with them, um, was, was one of the references as to how it used those eyes just to be rather odd and intriguing, I suppose. Actually, no, it's just because that's the way it was. Um, I shall get my next picture ready for you. I just have to remember which one it is. Nearly there. Hmm. Ah, found it. Right. Sorry about that. Uh, just trying to find the right illustration for the next next part of the story, because sometimes I miss them, and it's it, they help the story to to just sort of work well. Because back in the day, they used to actually have illustrations with a children's chapter book in in the. Um, story just to help you to picture it a little bit better and I like to be able to share them with you anyway right here we go um, that's right I was showing you a picture of the Samiad just to help you to, to picture it a little bit better so they're asking the Samiad about taking gifts back to help them to basically buy their way into someone's good graces but it shook its head and shot out its snail's eyes hopelessly. I'm not allowed to play in this game, it said. Of course, I could find out in a minute where the thing was, only I mayn't. Because the, they have, the children, um, there was an agreement they made with the Samiad that they were not to ask for wishes from the Samiad, which means that unless it specifically chooses of itself to do something, it is not to do those things. And there may actually be also some other connection to do with the amulet itself. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But I may go so far as to own that your idea of taking things with you isn't a bad one. And I shouldn't show them all at once. Take small things and conceal them craftily about your persons. So the Samiad can't tell them what time period to go to. But he is say, it is saying that, yes, taking some small gifts would be a good idea. But don't give them all at once. Don't let, let the people you're visiting know that you have all of these wonderful gifts. Just sort of have them available for when you need them. There you go. This advice seemed good. Soon the table was littered over with things which the children thought likely to interest ancient Egyptians. Anthea brought dolls, puzzle blocks, a wooden tea service, a green leather case with necessaire written on it in gold letters. Aunt Emma had once given it to Anthea and it had then contained scissors, a pen knife, bodkin, which is like a little wee thing for poking holes um, for certain purposes, stiletto, which I think is a different sort of thin knife, very sharp, like a little miniature dagger, thimble, corkscrew and glove buttoner, because they used to wear gloves and to, to do up the buttons that ran down your wrist to make the glove fit beautifully on your hand it would have a, a slit there so you could get your hand through but to make it fit nicely around your wrist you would have button and buttonhole on each side of this bit down your wrist and because it was very very close fitting 
it was very hard to try and do it with your fingers and so you used a buttonhole glove buttoner and so you poked the hook thing through the buttonhole and around the button and then pulled the button back through the buttonhole and flipped it out rather complicated but yes my grandparent my one of my grandmothers had one which is why i know about them the scissors th knife and thimble and pen knife were of course lost but the other things were there and as good as new cyril contributed lead soldiers toy soldiers nowadays we have plastic ones a cannon a catapult a tin opener a tie clip and a tennis ball and a padlock with no key robert collected a candle I don't suppose they ever saw a self a self fitting paraffin one he said I think he means uh, it's not something we talk about with candles now but um, candles these days ones that are used specifically for light not for setting mood the width of the wax of the candle is actually related to the thickness of the wick that they use so that when it burns you don't have an empty shell standing up around the edge and then the, the wick down here getting drowned in melted wax. You get a, a bunch of it is melted and burnt by the wick and then any excess dribbles down the outsides. And so it's actually specially worked out so that your candle doesn't drown itself but also you don't just have dry wick burning because it's not going to provide a light for very long. And I think that's what they mean here by... Uh, with Robert saying, I don't suppose they ever saw a self-fitting paraffin one. Paraffin wax is what they're made out of. A penny Japanese pin tray, so it's a tray made in Japan, or Japanese style for putting pins in, and it would have cost a penny at the markets. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Tina says, I always seem to learn something new with you. Yeah, there's just so much stuff that I know, which I don't even realise I know till it comes up in a story. Anyway, so, but it's lots of fun. I used to really enjoy discovering things. My grandmother had the set of drawers that were about this wide and twice as tall. And the, each of the drawers was about this big. And she used to have sewing things in one and different sewing things in another and stamps in another and, and things like a little awl which is a little bit like what they referred to as the um, 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 the bodkin, um, a button hook, a nail file, a metal nail file, all sorts of things. All of these drawers had things in them, and it was such a, a, a wonderful, fun time discovering what was in them. Sometimes she had letters in them and all sorts of stuff like that, but it was a great little thing. I don't even know where the cabinet went. It's probably down at my mum and dad's place. Anyway, but yeah thoroughly enjoyed learning about stuff by exploring things and I think that a lot of children miss out these days because they don't get enough time to actually explore ideas and objects and stuff like that. Boredom is also a very useful thing for children to learn because it means they have to start using their imagination and thinking of things for themselves. So all of those things. Yeah, we had plenty of time to get bored, but we usually didn't get bored because we actually came up, either invented a game or discovered something that was worth finding out what it could do. Like even, what are you going to do with this stick? And why is the stick different to that stick? Well, the bark is different. And the colour of the wood inside is different too. I wonder why. Does that mean it came from a different sort of tree or a different part of the same tree? All of those things add up in your head and help you to learn things and when I went to school and I was doing things like biology for science in the later years there was not really a lot that was brand new stuff that they tried to teach us because a lot of things I had noticed or observed specifically and played around with ideas of um, and so all they were doing was confirming a lot of stuff and then adding on some information anyway so I like learning things and I wish that other people had the opportunity to learn things in a way that was fun. So therefore when I realise that something is not necessarily commonly understood, I'll happily share the information just because to me it's relevant, even if it's not to others. Um, oh yes, boredom and ADHD mix well. They do, not just for you but for me as well. 
Um, it makes you use your imagination and do things such as writing stories, researching things and stuff. Absolutely. Boredom is so key for learning stuff if it's self-motivated learning. I love it, I love it. And being ADHD, you can dive really deep into some information. And then when you start to get lightly bored with that, you flip into something else, or you actually see connections that other people don't see because your brain is just firing off in so many different areas. I'm glad other people have that sort of thing going on too. Anyway, so where do we get to? A penny Japanese pin tray, um, it was, it was um, Lacquered, it was probably lacquered. Um, it was common for things that were Chinese style or Japanese style to be um, very simple shape, beautifully finished timber work, not usually very heavy, and often with a base of black and then a picture painted onto it and then a sealed coating put over it so it would stay nice and shiny. And that was often the style that they would refer to as Japanese or Chinese for things in this time period. So uh, a penny Japanese pin tray, a rubber stamp with his father's name and address on it, that would be for putting on to letters and envelopes, and a piece of putty. Putty is used for sealing glass into window frames, and it's made with linseed oil and something else, I'm not sure what, very, very fine, and you squeeze it in along the edge of where the glass comes into the wood, and initially it's very soft and it's lots of fun to play with and pull it out and model it into things like plasticine. But eventually it dry, the oil on the surface of it dries out and it goes hard, but it keeps the glass from rattling and from leaking. And it used to be something that we, Dad would tell us off for picking the putty out of the window frame if he'd put some new glass in. And uh, yeah, so I wasn't the only one. Uh, because Robert has already got some putty. Jane added a key ring, the brass handle of a poker, whatever that's going to be used for, a pot that had held cold cream, a smoked pearl button off her winter coat, so smoked colour probably, and a key with no lock. We can't take all this rubbish, said Robert with some scorn. We must just each choose one thing. The afternoon passed very agreeably in the attempt to choose from the table the four most suitable objects, but the four children could not agree what was suitable, and at last Cyril said, look here, let's each be blindfolded and reach out and take the first thing you touch your stick to, which is a good way to do it because then it's not by what, what you're feeling that you would specifically choose. Look here, uh, no we've read that but that was done, Cyril touched the padlock, Anthea got the necessaire, Robert clutched the candle, and Jane picked up the tie clip. It's not much, she said. I don't believe ancient Egyptians wore ties. Never mind, said Anthea. I believe it's luckier not to really choose. In the stories, it's always the thing the woodcutter's son picks up in the forest and almost throws away because he thinks it's no good, but turns out to be the magic thing in the end, or else someone's lost it, and he's rewarded with the hand of the king's daughter in marriage. Yes, it's the same in games, computer games. I'm always poking around the edges in computer games, finding out what this thing's for and, and that sort of stuff. It takes me a lot longer to play a game because of it. Although I often get an extra, um, um, what do you call it? Achievement. If, like if it's a game that's that I got through Steam, I'll often get achievements for having discovered all of the discoverable things. Not necessarily the hidden things, but the discoverable things. I don't want any hands in marriage, thank you, said Cyril firmly. Nor yet me, said Robert. It's always the end of the adventures when it comes to the marriage hands. Are we ready, said Anthea. It is Egypt we're going to, isn't it? Nice Egypt, said Jane. I wouldn't go anywhere I don't know about, like that dreadful big wavy burning mountain city, she insisted. That was um, Atlantis, right in its very last moments. Then the Samiad was coaxed into its bag. I say, said Cyril suddenly, I'm rather sick of kings, and people notice you so in palaces. Besides, the amulet's sure to be in a temple. Let's go among the common people and try to work ourselves up by degrees. We might get taken on as temple assistants. Like beadles, said Anthea, or vergers. Those are both offices held within the church, the Anglican church at the time. Job roles, a 
a beetle does certain things and a verger does other things. You can look them up and find out what they actually are. I know of them, but I can't remember specifically. They must have splendid chances of stealing the temple treasures. Right-o, was the general rejoinder. The charm was held up. It grew big once again, and once again the warm golden eastern light glowed softly beyond it. As the children stepped through it, loud and furious voices rang in their ears. They went suddenly from the quiet of Fitzroy Street dining room into a very angry eastern crowd. A crowd much too angry to notice them. They edged through it to the wall of a house and stood there. The crowd was of men, women and children. There were all sorts of complexions and pictures of them might have been coloured by any child with a shilling paint box. The colours that the child would have used for complexions, that's skin colour, would have been yellow ochre, red ochre, light red, sepia and India ink. But their faces were painted already, black eyebrows and lashes and some red lips. The women wore a sort of pinafore with shoulder straps and loose things wound round their heads and shoulders. The men wore very little clothing, for they were the working people, and the Egyptian boys and girls wore nothing at all unless you count the little ornaments hung on chains round their necks and waists. The children saw all this before they could hear anything distinctly. Everyone was shouting so. Sorry, I'm just getting ready to put up the picture, but it's not quite there yet. But a voice sounded above the other voices, and presently it was speaking in a silence. Comrades and fellow workers, it said, and it was the voice of a tall, coppery-coloured man who had climbed into a chariot that had been stopped by the crowd. Its owner had bolted, muttering something about calling the guards, and now the man spoke from it. Comrades and fellow workers, how long are we to endure the tyranny of our masters who live in idleness and luxury on the fruit of our toil? They only give us a bare subsistence wage, and they live on the fat of the land. We labour all our lives to keep them in wanton luxury. Let us make an end to it. A roar of applause follow answered him. How are you going to do it? cried a voice. You look out, cried another, or you'll get yourself into trouble. I've heard almost every single word of that, whispered Robert, in Hyde Park last Sunday. There's a place in Hyde Park called Speaker's Corner where if you want to give speeches about things so that people can hear and decide if they agree with you and all that sort of stuff, that's the place to go. Um, so people who are making a speech about the injustices of, of the modern government or, or um, working conditions or something like that can actually speak there. They are allowed to speak there. And so that's what Robert's referring to as he's heard all these sort of words at Hyde Park. Let us strike for more bread and onions. There you go. There's the man standing in the chariot. That's why he's a bit taller than the others. That's the front of the chariot there. Let us strike for more bread and onions and beer and a longer midday rest, the speaker went on. You are tired. You are hungry. You are thirsty. You are poor. Your wives and children are pining for food. The barns of the rich are full to bursting with the corn we want. The corn our labour has grown. To the granaries! Corn being... The, the common grain that was in use at the time. That's what the co word corn actually means. So that he's pointing to the granaries. To the granaries, cried half the crowd. But another voice shouted clear above the tumult, to Pharaoh, to the king, let's present a petition to the king. He will listen to the voice of the oppressed. For a moment, the crowd swayed one way and another, first towards the granaries and then towards the palace. Then, with a rush like that of an imprisoned torrent, suddenly set free, it surged along the street towards the palace, and the children were carried with it. Anthea found it difficult to keep the Samiad from being squeezed very uncomfortably. The crowd swept through the streets of dull-looking houses with few windows very high up across the market where people were not buying but exchanging goods, in other words, not using coins or money. In a momentary pause, Robert saw a basket of onions exchanged for a hair comb and five fish for a string of beads. 
The people in the market seemed better off than those in the crowd. They had finer clothes and more of them. They were the kind of people who nowadays would have lived at Brixton or Broccoli. So this is not my nowadays, this or even 20 or 30 years ago. This is in the beginning of the 20th century nowadays. So Brixton back then was quite a pleasant area. When I was growing up, Brixton was a place that had a lot of trouble because they had the Brixton riots there. So it's kind of, it had kind of gone down a bit downhill a bit. Generally you don't have riots in suburbs where people are well off. They're usually in suburbs where people are not so well off um, and they are protesting that some people have life better than them. Or other things that they're protesting about. Anyway, carrying on. What's the trouble now? A languid, large-eyed lady in a crimped, half-transparent linen dress with her black hair very much braided and puffed out, asked a date seller. Oh, the working men, discontented as usual, the man answered. Listen to them. Anyone would think it mattered whether they had a little more or less to eat. Dregs of society, said the date seller. Scum, said the lady. And I've heard that before too, said Robert. In other words, some things don't change. At that moment, the voice of the crowd changed from anger to doubt, from doubt to fear. There were other voices shouting. They sounded defi shouted defiance and menace, and they came nearer very quickly. There was the rattle of wheels and the pounding of hooves. A voice shouted, Guards! The guards! The guards! shouted another voice, and the voice of workmen took up the cry, The guards! Pharaoh's guards! And swaying a little more, a little once more, the crowd hung for a moment as it were balanced. Then, as the trampling hooves came nearer, the workmen fled, dispersed, up alleys and into the courts of houses, and the guards in their embossed leather chariots swept down the street at a gallop their wheels clattering over the stones and their dark-coloured blue tunics, blown open and back with the wind of their going. So, that riot's over, said the crimped linen-dressed lady. That's a blessing. And did you notice the captain of the guard? What a very handsome man he was, to be sure. The four children had taken advantage of the moment's pause before the crowd turned to fly, to edge themselves and drag each other into an arched doorway. Sorry, I'm just going to check in case there's a picture I'm meant to be giving you. Um, so I don't really want you to miss out. Right, ready for the next one. Um, now, now they each drew a long breath and looked at the others. We're well out of that, said Cyril. Yes, said Anthea, but I do wish the poor men hadn't been driven back before they could get to the king. He might have done something for them. Not if he was the one in the Bible, he wouldn't, said Jane. He had a hard heart. That's the story about Moses. Ah, that was the Moses one, Anthea explained. The Joseph one was quite different. I should like to see Pharaoh's house. I wonder whether it's like the Egyptian court in the Crystal Palace. Now, the Crystal Palace was like a giant greenhouse made out of glass, and it was used as an ex a series of exhibition halls for the World Expo that they had at the time there. It was a trade show, largely, but there were other things as well that, that were part of it. Um, we have a very miniature version of a similar sort of thing, very, very miniature. In Auckland, there's a place called the Domain, which is a great big park, which has our, a big museum at the top of it. And then just down the hill from there, we have what's called the Winter Gardens. And the Winter Gardens have these glass houses. Now, by my standards, they're large glass houses, but they're tiny compared with the Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace was called that because of the shine of all this glass. Um, and then in the later stages when it was kept up, even though they moved it to a different part of London, um, it would have some things that were on display permanently there, but I think they also had exotic trees and plants from other countries to, so that people could come and see them and things like this. It's no longer there. It burnt down because the framing was all timber and then it had frameworks inside for different, um, like different floor levels and it was, so that sort of thing and it just got destroyed by a great big fire.
Anyway, so Crystal Palace was a real place and it's now actually a Crystal Palace is also the name now of a certain area in London and a, a train or a, a, an underground station. Um, and so as part of this, this uh, World Fair, basically, they had trade stuff there, but they also had stuff that was representing different countries. And so they had, as the children are saying, an Egyptian court was one of the things they had there. And so the children have quite possibly actually been and seen it at Crystal Palace. I should like to see Pharaoh's house. I wonder whether it's like the Egyptian court and the Crystal Palace. I thought we decided to try to get taken on in a temple, said Cyril in injured tones. Yes, but we've got to know someone first. Couldn't we make friends with a temple doorkeeper? We might give him the padlock or something. I wonder which are temples and which are palaces, Robert added, glancing across the marketplace to where an enormous gateway with huge sided buildings towered towards the sky. To the right and left of it were other buildings, only a little less magnificent. Did, did you wish to seek out the Temple of Amun-Ra, said a soft voice behind them, or the Temple of Mut, or the Temple of Khonsu? They turned to find beside them a young man. He was shaved clean from head to foot, and on his feet were light papyrus sandals. He was clothed in a linen tunic of white, embroidered heavily with colours. He was happy, um, sorry, trying to find the right words now. He was gay with anklets, bracelets and armlets of gold, richly inlaid. He wore a ring on his finger and he had a short jacket of gold embroidery, something like the zo Zoave soldiers wear. Not sure what they are. Maybe somebody can look them up. Z-O-U-A-V-E. I'm guessing it's from a particular nationality or a particular part of the world. And on his neck was a gold collar with many amulets hanging from it. But among the amulets, the children could see none like theirs. It doesn't matter which temple, said Cyril, frankly. Tell me your mission, said the young man. I am a divine father of the temple of Amun-Ra, and perhaps I can tell, help you. Well, said Cyril, we've come from the great empire on which the sun never sets. I thought you'd, that somehow you'd come from some odd, out-of-the-way spot, said the priest, with courtesy, and we've seen a good many palaces. We thought we should like to see a temple for a change, said Robert. The Samiad stirred uneasily in its embroidered bag. Thank you for following, Aunt. Um, have you brought gifts to the temple, asked the priest, cautiously. We have got some gifts, said Cyril, with equal caution. You see, there's magic mixed up in it, so we can't tell you everything. But we don't want to give our gifts for nothing. Beware how you insult the god, said the priest sternly. I can also do magic. I can make a waxen image of you, and I can say words which, as the wax image melts before the fire, will make you dwindle away and at last perish miserably. Huh, said Cyril stoutly, that's nothing. I can make fire itself. I should jolly well like to see you do it, said the priest unbelievingly. Well, you shall, said Cyril. Nothing easier. Just stand close round me. Do you need no preparation, no fasting, no incantations? The priest's tone was incredulous. The incantation's quite short, said Cyril, taking the hint, and as for fasting, it's not needed in my sort of magic. Union Jack, printing press, gunpowder, rule Britannia, come fire at the end of this little stick, said Cyril. He had pulled a match from his pocket, and as he ended the incantation, which contained no words that it seemed likely the Egyptian had ever heard, he stood in the little crowd of his relations and the priest and struck the match on his boot, because they were not safety matches then. He stood up, shielding the flame with one hand. See, said he with modest pride, here, take it into your hand. No, thank you, said the priest, swiftly backing. Can you do that again? Yes. Then come with me to the great double house of Pharaoh. He loves good magic, and he will raise you to honour and glory. There's no need of secrets between initiates, he went on confidentially. The fact is, I am out of favour at present, owing to a little matter of failure of prophecy. 
so he's hoping to win back favour from the pharaoh. I told him a beautiful princess would be sent to him from Syria, and lo, a woman thirty years old arrived. But she was a beautiful woman not so long ago. Time is only a mode of thought, you know. The children thrilled to those familiar words. So you know that too, do you? said Cyril. It is a part of the mystery of all magic, is it not? said the priest. Now, if I bring you to Pharaoh, the little unpleasantness I spoke of will be forgotten, and I will ask Pharaoh, the great house, son of the sun, the lord of the south and north, to decree that you shall lodge in the temple, then you can have a good look around and teach me your magic, and I will teach you mine. <laughs> This idea seemed good, at least it was better than any other which at that moment occurred to anybody, so they followed the priest through the city. <laughs> oh, where's this one going to go? Mm, are we going to get in trouble here? Probably. Are we going to have someone demanding something of the children? Likely. It's ha this sort of thing has happened before, but with different people, hasn't it? In different specific situations. Mmm, we'll see what happens. Anyway, let's carry on. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. Oh, dear. These children have a way of getting into trouble because they don't always mind their implications and what they're saying. Sometimes they just get a little bit too enthusiastic. But we'll see. Right. Carrying on. So they followed the priest through the city. Hang on, just check that last. At least it was... I will teach you mine. This idea seemed good, at least it was better than any other, which at that moment occurred to anybody, so they followed the priest through the city. The seats, streets, seats, the streets were very narrow and dirty. Now, in hot countries, often the streets are a little bit narrower, so there's always a little bit of shadow. Not all of them, but some, some hot countries where there's a lot of sun. The, the buildings are tall enough that when you have the streets narrow, sorry, try and get my hands straight, then the sun, when it's shining down, doesn't get right down to the ground level, and so it doesn't get necessarily quite as hot. I don't know if that's part of it, but we'll find out. If, uh, if it's relevant, we'll find out. Yes, they are children. Yes, they are impulsive. Yes, they do say things that aren't always as well thought out as they think they are. Anyway, we're carrying on. So they followed the piece... We'll try that again. So they followed the priest through the city. The streets were very narrow and dirty. The best houses, the priest explained, were built within walls 20 to 25 feet high. That's a long way up. And such windows as showed in the walls were very high up. That would mean that other people can't get in easily. Hmm. The tops of palm trees showed above the walls. The poor people's houses were little square huts with a door and two windows and smoke coming out of a hole in the in the back. Hmm. The poor Egyptians haven't improved so very much in their building since the first time we came to Egypt, whispered Cyril to Anthea. The huts were roofed with palm branches and everywhere there were chickens and goats and little naked children kicking about in the yellow dust. On one roof was a goat who had climbed up and was eating the dry palm leaves with snorts and head tossings of delight, a little bit like eating hay, I suppose. Over every house door was some sort of figure or shape. Amulets, the priest explained, to keep off the evil eye. I don't think much of your nice Egypt, Robert, whispered to Jane. It's simply not a patch on Babylon. Excuse me. Ah, you wait till you see the palace, said Jane, whispering back. The palace was indeed much more magnificent than anything they had yet seen that day, though it would have made but a poor show beside that of the Babylonian king. I don't know what the time periods are like between this visit to Egypt and when they went to Babylon. 
They came to it through a great square pillared doorway of sandstone that stood in a high brick wall. The, su- the shut doors were of massive cedar with bronze hinges and they were studded with bronze nails. At the side was a little door and a wicket gate. Now a wicket gate is usually a small gate let into a bigger gate. Not necessarily wicker, but wicket. That's just the terminology used. It's kind of like um, like if you've got an old-fashioned English castle and you've got this great big door or gateway that's solid, um, that can be opened, you don't want to be opening it just to let an, a, an individual through because it's a lot of effort to move the thing and so you have a wicket gate within it. And so that can let out, a, it's a person-sized gate, so you can let people in and out individually without actually having to go through all this effort to move the big high gate that's very heavy. So I'm guessing it's the same sort of idea. At the side was a little door and a wicket gate, and through this the priest led the children. He seemed to know a word that made the sentries make way for him. So obviously... He's got the password. Mmm, yes. Mm Mm-hmm, indeed. (laughs) Inside was a garden, planted with hundreds of different kinds of trees and flowering shrubs, a lake full of fish, with blue lotus flowers at the margin, that's around the edge, and ducks swimming about cheerfully and looking, as Jane said, quite modern. Oh, this is interesting. Hmm. Uh, I've lost my place on the page. Ducks swimming about cheerfully and and looking, as Jane said, quite modern. The guard chamber, the storehouses, the Queen's house, said the priest, pointing them out. So he's really, it sounds like he's really trying to impress them, isn't it? Doesn't it? um, They passed through the open courtyards paved with flat stones and the priest whispered to a guard at the inner gate. Another time he's using his special words. We are fortunate, he said to the children. Pharaoh is even now in the court of honour. Now, don't forget to be overcome with respect and admiration. It won't do any harm if you fall flat on your faces. And whatever you do, don't speak until you are spoken to. There used to be that rule in our country, said Robert, when my father was a little boy. (laughs) At the outer end of the great hall, a crowd of people were arguing with and even shoving the guards, who seemed to make it a rule not to let anyone through unless they were bribed to do it. Oh dear, have they brought enough stuff to use as bribes? Because if they haven't, they're not going to actually have anything to show the pharaoh. The children heard several promises of the utmost richness and wondered whether they would ever be kept. I'm thinking the guards probably were wondering the same thing too. All round the hall were pillars of painted wood. The roof was of cedar, gorgeously inlaid. About halfway up the wall was a wide, shallow step that went right across the hall, then a little further on, another, and then a steep flight of narrower steps leading right up to the throne on which the pharaoh sat. He sat there, very splendid, his red and white double crown on his head and his scepter in his hand. The throne had a canopy of wood and wooden pillars painted in bright colours. On a low, broad bench that ran all round the hall sat the friends, relatives and courtiers of the king leaning on richly covered cushions. The priest led the children up the steps till they all stood before the throne, and then suddenly he fell flat on his face with hands outstretched. And you will know the pose if you have read Asterix and Cleopatra. There you go. The others did the same. Anthea raised... Yeah, he fell flat on his face with his hands outstretched. The others did the same. Anthea falling very carefully because of the Samiad. Raise them, said the voice of Pharaoh, that they may speak to me. The officers of the king's household raised them. Who are these strangers? Pharaoh asked and added very crossly. And what do you mean, Rekmara? 
by daring to come into my presence while your innocence is not yet established. So obviously that's the priest. Oh, great king, said the young priest, you are the very image of Ra and the likeness of his son Horus in every respect. You know the thoughts of the hearts of the gods and of men, and you have divined that these strangers are the children of the children of the vile and conquered kings of the empire where the sun never sets. They know a magic not known to Egyptians, and they come with gifts in their hands as tribute to Pharaoh, in whose heart is the wisdom of the gods, and on his lips their truth. So as much flattery as you can manage to put in there, plus also a little bit of information. That is all very well, said the pharaoh, but where are the gifts? The children, bowing as well as they could in their embarrassment, at finding themselves a centre of interest in a circle more grand, more golden and more highly coloured than they could have imagined yet possible, pulled out the padlock, the nécessaire and the tie clip. But it is not tribute all the same. Cyril muttered, England does not pay tribute. Pharaoh examined all the things with great interest when the chief of the household had taken them up to him. Picture. Finding the right button. There's Pharaoh. And there's the, the chap who's bringing the things over to him to show him. And there's some of his guards. And there's some of the courtiers. And there's some of the others on the other side of his throne. The pharaoh examined all the things with great interest when the chief of the household had taken them up to him. Deliver them to the keeper of the treasury, he said to one near him. And to the children, he said, a small tribute truly, but strange and not worth without worth. And the magic, O Rekmara. These unworthy sons of a conquered nation, began Rek Mara. Nothing of the kind, Cyril whispered angrily, because he's very English and England at the time was head of a huge empire and not really what he wanted to actually have the impression given of where he comes from. But he's also very impulsive because he's still a child. Of a vile and conquered nation can make fire to spring from dry wood in the sight of all. I should jolly well like to see them do it, said Pharaoh, just as the priest had done. Sorry, I'm do having a hard time with the words. I should jolly well like to see them do it, said Pharaoh, just as the priest had done. So Cyril, without more ado, did it. Do more magic said the king with simple appreciation. He cannot do any more magic, said Anthea suddenly, and all eyes were turned on her. Because of the voice of the free people who are shouting for bread and onions and beer and a long midday rest, if the people had what they wanted, he could do more. Hmm. A rude-spoken girl, said the pharaoh. But Give the dogs what they want, he said without turning his head. Let them have their rest and their extra rations. There are plenty of slaves to work. A richly dressed official hurried out. You will be the idol of the people, Rekmara whispered joyously. The temple of Amun will not contain their offerings. Cyril struck another match. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt. It's so good that you're enjoying it. I'm really pleased that you are. That's great. Um, yeah, I tend to interrupt myself a lot and give explanations if I think that it's something that most people these days aren't necessarily going to understand. And sometimes I get them wrong, but that's okay. So I'm glad you're here and that you're enjoying it too. And thank you also for following Q. I'm not quite sure how you want your name said, but I hope you're okay with me calling you Q. Right, I'm going to carry on with reading though because otherwise I'll get so lost I won't be able to find where I got up to. <laughs> Not too unusual, but it, it just makes the whole story take a lot longer and we lose the thread. So, um, Cyril struck another match and all the court was overwhelmed with delight and wonder and when Cyril took the candle from his pocket... Sorry, but she knows. 
and lighted it with the match and then held the burning candle up before the king, the enthusiasm knew no bounds. O greatest of all, before whom sun and moon and stars bow down, said Rekmara insinuatingly, am I pardoned? Is my innocence made plain? Which is really why he wanted the children to come with him, isn't it? Remember? Sorry, I'm finding the next picture. Just because I know there's going to be another one sometime soon. Uh, where do we get up to? All right, yeah. As plain as ever will be, I dare say, said the pharaoh shortly. Get along with you. You are pardoned. Go in peace. The priest went with lightning swiftness. And what, said the king suddenly, is, in, is it that moves in that sack? Show me, O oh strangers. Oh dear, did you remember what's in the bag? One that says Sam's tra Trav car? The Samiad's travel carriage, the bag. Oh no, what's going to happen? Show me, O oh strangers. There was nothing for it but to show the Samiad. Seize it, said Pharaoh carelessly. A very curious monkey. It will be a nice little novelty for my wild beast collection. And instantly the entreaties of the children, availing as little as the bites of the Samiad, though both bites and entreaties were fervent, it was carried away from before their eyes. Oh, do be careful, said Anthea. At least keep it dry, keep it in its sacred house. She held up the embroidered bag. It is a magic creature, said Robert. It's simply priceless. You've got no right to take it away, said Jane incautiously. It's a shame, a barefaced robbery. That's what it is. There was an awful silence. Then Pharaoh spoke. Take the sacred house of the beast from them, he said, and in prison all. Tonight after supper it may be our pleasure to see more magic. Guard them well and do not torture them. Yet. Oh dear, sobbed Jane as they were led away. I knew exactly what it would be. Oh, I wish you hadn't. Shut up, silly, said Cyril. You know you would come to Egypt. It was your own idea entirely. Shut up. It'll be all right. I thought we should play ball with queens, sobbed Jane, and have no end of larks. And now everything's going to be perfectly horrid. Jane's the youngest. The room they were shut up in was a room and not a dungeon, as the elder ones had feared. That, as Anthea said, was one comfort. There were paintings on the wall that at any other time would have been most interesting, and a sort of low couch and chairs. When they were alone, Jane breathed a sigh of relief. Now we can get home all right, she said. And leave the Samiad, said Anthea reproachfully. Wait a sec, I've got an idea, said Cyril. He pondered for a few moments. Then he began hammering on the heavy cedar door. It opened and a guard put, out, put in his head. Stop that row, he said sternly, or... Look here, said Cyril, interrupting. It's a very... Sorry, burping. Look here, said Cyril, interrupting. It's very dull for you, isn't it? Just doing nothing but guarding us. Wouldn't you like to see some magic? We're not too proud to do it for you. Wouldn't you like to see it? I wouldn't mind if I do, said the guard. Well then, you get us that monkey of ours that was taken away and we'll show you. How do I know you're not making game of me, said the soldier. Good question. Shouldn't wonder if you only wanted to get the creature so as to set it on me. I dare say its teeth and claws are poisonous. Well, look here, said Robert. You see, we've got nothing with us. You just shut the door and open it again in five minutes and we've, we'll have got a magic, oh, I don't know, a magic flower in a pot for you. If you can do that, you can do anything, said the soldier. And he went out and barred the door. Meaning that they can probably go and get the Samiad themselves, I suppose. <laughs> um, then, of course... They held up the amulet. So he's basically given them the hint. 
Then of course they held up the amulet. They found the east by holding it up and turning slowly until the amulet began to grow big. There you go. The amulet began to grow big. They walked home through it and came back with a geranium and full scarlet flower from the staircase window of the Fitzroy Street house. Well, said the soldier when he came in, I really am. Here's your picture. There's the door. There's the soldier. There's the children. And there's the geranium in the pot. Well, said the soldier when he came in, I really am. We can do much more wonderful things than that. Oh, ever so much, said Anthea persuasively. If we only have our monkey, and here's tuppence for you. The soldier looked at the tuppence. What's this? he said. Robert explained how much simpler it was to pay money for things than to exchange them as the people were doing in the market. Later on, the soldier gave the coins to his captain, who later still showed them to Pharaoh. Oh dear, where's this one going to go? I'm thinking that we might have something is going to happen. Hmm, does it sound familiar? The potential for things to go wrong? Yes. Who later still showed them to Pharaoh, who of course kept them and was much struck with the idea. That was really how coins first came to be used in Egypt. You will not believe this, I dare say, but really, if you believe the rest of the story, I don't see why you shouldn't believe this as well. Good point. I say, said Anthea, struck by a sudden thought, I suppose it'll be all right around about those workmen. The king won't go back on, go back on what he said about them just because he's angry with us. Oh no, said the soldier, you see, he's rather afraid of magic. He'll keep his word right enough. Then that's all right, said Robert. And Anthea said softly and coaxingly, Ah, do get us the monkey and then you'll see some lovely magic. Do. There's a nice, kind soldier. I don't know where they've put your precious monkey, but if I can get another chap to take on my duty here, I'll see what I can do, he said grudgingly and went out. Do you mean, said Robert, that we're going off without even trying for the other half of the amulet? I really think we'd better, said Anthea tremulously. Of course, the other half of the amulet's here somewhere or our half wouldn't have brought us here. I do wish we could find it. It's a pity we don't know any real magic. Then we could find out. I do wonder where it is, exactly. If they had only known it, something very like the other half of the amulet was very near them. It was hung round the neck of someone and that someone was watching them through a chink high up in the wall, especially devised for watching people who were imprisoned. But they did not know. There was nearly an hour of anxious waiting. They tried to take an interest in the picture on the wall, a picture of harpers playing very odd harps and women dancing at a feast. They examined the painted plaster floor and the chairs were of white painted wood with coloured stripes at intervals, but the time went slowly, and everyone had time to think of how Pharaoh had said, don't torture them yet. If the worst comes to the worst, said Cyril, we must just bunk and leave the Samiad. I believe it can take care of itself well enough. They won't kill it or hurt it when they find it can speak and give wishes. They'll build it a temple, I shouldn't wonder. I couldn't bear to go without it, said Anthea, and Pharaoh said, after supper, and that won't be just yet. And the soldier was curious. I'm sure we're all right for the present. All the same, the sounds of the door being unbarred seem one of the prettiest sounds possible. I can imagine. <laughs> it would be quite delightful to hear, finally something's happening, as long as it's good. Suppose he hasn't got the Samiad, whispered Jane. But that doubt was set at rest by the Samiad itself, for almost before the door was open, it sprang through the chink of it into Anthea's arms, shivering and hunching up its fur. Here's its fancy overcoat, said the soldier, holding out the bag into which the Samiad immediately crept. Now, said Cyril, what would you like us to do? Anything you'd like us to get for you? Any 
any little trick you like, said the soldier. If you can get a strange flower blooming in an earthenware vase, you can get anything, I suppose, he said. I just wish I'd got two men's loads of jewels from the king's treasury. I don't know if you should have said the thing about the treasury. I just wish I'd got two men's loads of jewels from the king's treasury. That's what I've always wished for. And I'm just sitting a little bit closer to my microphone because the rain is hitting the chimney again. Sorry about that. I can't do anything about the rain, but I'm hoping that it'll make me louder than the rain. So you can still hear me okay while I'm reading. Mm. At the word wish, the children knew that the Samiad would attend to that bit of magic. It did and the floor was littered with a spreading heap of gold and precious stones. Oh, the noise of that wind! Yes, I can see that you are getting the noise of that wind. There's not a lot I can do to turn that down, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just wondering if I can move my um, camera picture a little bit better so I don't look like I'm too hunched down to get near my microphone you can still hear me you can now see the back of the chair but that's all right doesn't matter right getting ready for the next picture at the word wish the children knew that the samiad would attend to that bit of magic it did and the floor was littered with a spreading heap of gold and precious stones oh yes i'm so glad i'm inside with this current weather my daughter lives in wellington which is down further south for those of you who aren't used to New Zealand and they've got a lot more cold and much more intense wind and rain than what we have up here I'm up further north anyway um, gold and precious stones any other little trick asked Cyril loftily shall we become invisible vanish yes if you like said the soldier but not through the door you don't he closed it carefully and set his broad Egyptian back against it no, no, cried a voice high up amongst the tops of the tall wooden pillars that stood against the wall. There was a sound of someone moving above. The soldier was as much surprised as anybody. That's magic if you like, he said. And then Jane held up the amulet, uttering the word of power. At the sound of it, and at the sight of the amulet growing into the great arch, the soldier fell flat on his face among the jewels with a cry of awe and terror. So there's the archway on the top of the amulet as it grows bigger. There's the children stepping through and here's the soldier falling flat on his face amongst the, the jewels and the, gold, and the gold. The children went through the arch with a quickness born of long practice, but Jane stayed in the middle of the arch and looked back. The others standing on the dining room carpet in Fitzroy Street turned and saw her still in the arch. Someone's holding her, cried Cyril. We must go back. But they pulled at Jane's hands just to see if she would come, and of course she did come. Then as usual the arch was little again, and there they were. Oh, I do wish you hadn't, Jane said crossly. It was so interesting. The priest had come in and he was kicking the soldier and telling him he'd done it now and they must take the jewels and flee for their lives. And did they? I don't know. You interfered, said Jane ungratefully. I should have liked to see the last of it. As a matter of fact, none of them had seen the last of it. If by it, Jane meant the adventure of the priest and the soldier and that's the end of that chapter and I'm sorry but that's the end of today's reading because the next chapter is a particularly long one Whew. sometimes this author writes short chapters and sometimes she writes long chapters and this book te has a tendency to have longer chapters but not usually quite as long as the next one is so the next chapter just to give you a teaser is chapter 12 the sorry present and the expelled little boy hmm intriguing anyway so it's so good that you can all be here i'm really enjoying having some people here listening and then getting involved with the chat and all that sort of stuff thank you for all your new followers 
Um, it's, it's great to have you as part of it. Um, I love being able to read to you. I really do. It's something that reading has always been very important to me. And so it's lovely to be able to share it, especially if there's stories which other people haven't yet read. Um, one of the stories by the same author that a lot more people are familiar with is The Railway Children. And so it may be something that you've heard of before. It's actually one that a lot of people know because of um, a TV series that was based on it and also a children's movie from years and years and years ago, both English ones, I think. Um, but if you, if, you really, if you want to actually um, listen to that story just as a fresh one, um, if, if you haven't um, listened to it before or if you just haven't heard it for a while, then it's over on my YouTube channel, which I'm giving you the link for again. Um, under the playlists, there will be a playlist for uh, the Railway Children and also the other ones by the same author. Um, go there, have a listen, have lots of fun. I'm just going to give you the um, codex sorry typing um, the codex discord link again because um, that's where you'll find out a little bit more about the other readers they the, the readers have all written their own little mini bios over there and so if you join the discord server you can find out what book we're reading at the moment for our book club there is a movie club but I don't know anything about it yet I haven't explored that idea but if you want to follow any of the other readers in the codex group then they're all in the link down below my twitch video window on my about page. So you um, Q's saying they grew up in the British colonies with the British Library. Lots of good ones. Yes, um, it's one of the things I really enjoy about having a um, my, my place of residence, my home is New Zealand and because New Zealand is, has been part, was one of the British colonies and, is, and then the British Empire and now the British Commonwealth etc. My background for reading has largely been English-based stories rather than American, North American-based stories. Some Canadian ones, such as um, Ellen Montgomery, not Louise May Alcott, the other LM lady. Um, Ellen Montgomery, she was an, a Canadian author. So I had some Canadian books because uh, part of my family comes from Canada, but the rest come from the British Isles. Uh, English books. English background, English countryside, English ways of expressing things, English television in New Zealand, New Zealand TV, Australian TV, American, Canadian, but also English. It was all just part of our background. Yes, there were definitely some, some nasty racist stuff in amongst um, a whole lot of things in there, but there was some stuff that wasn't quite so bad, so that's good. Um, in amongst the books that I read, uh, there will be lines in there, attitudes in there which are racist. Uh, at the time they weren't necessarily considered so because racism wasn't something that people thought about. It wasn't something they had learnt to actually see other people as being of the same value as themselves. And rather than avoiding those ones, I don't tend to read books that are heavily racist but there will sometimes be some racist or even sexist attitudes I don't tend to avoid them because I do believe when it's a an aspect of it but not the whole focus of the story we can learn from it we can grow we can improve ourselves by actually looking at how people's attitudes were and going okay well is my attitude okay am I actually holding on to some attitudes that are more racist or more sexist than I had thought it helps us to actually look at ourselves and improve on. Oh, wonderful. You're Canadian. Cool. My grandfather, my mother's father, was Canadian. So, And I have actually spent not a long amount of time, but I have lived six months over there with some of the relatives from his side of the family um, and visited a few times too um, as an adult and also as a child. So it's so good that you can all be here. I'm thoroughly enjoying the fact that we've got a, such a broad spread of people who are listening to the stories and who are enjoying them. Uh, some who have read some of the book, other books by the same authors and other ones who it's completely new to and they're discovering new things. Um, all a big part of why I like reading. Um, so anyway, great to have you here. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next time if you can make it. Today is Monday in New Zealand. I'm just saying that for those who are uh, watching a recording in case you're not quite sure. I read Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 
uh, 3pm New Zealand time and if you're wanting to be part of the live stream by getting involved with chat listening when I'm actually reading rather than just a recording if you go to my Twitch page and if you're watching on YouTube there will be a link for that on my about section um, if you go to my Twitch page this the schedule section it will tell you what time that will be that I read in your time zone so that you can come back again when I'm here um, I usually technically I start the stream just before 3 p.m. at about 10 to 3 so that if there are any ads that Twitch wants to run if you come before 3 o'clock then those ads will be out of the way before I start reading that's just the idea anyway I don't know how well that works but we'll see anyway so thanks for being here thanks for listening I'm um, great to, to meet you if, if, if I hadn't met you before today it's great to have you here and to meet you those who have been here before lovely to have you as part of it I'm looking forward to seeing you all again next time or another time or whatever oh yeah time of day for you yes the time zone new zealand sits right on the on the the beginning of the of the the world's time zones basically so thank you i'm looking forward to having a good rest of my day it's now 5 p.m in the afternoon oh this was a long one today um and i look forward to seeing you next time so in the meantime happy reading <laughs> <laughs>